Okay, today's daf is Shabbat Kuf Mem Zayin. We're going to start at the Mishnah on Kuf Mem Vav Amubet. Today's Shi'or is sponsored by um, uh, David and Margie Zwebel in memory of David's father, Yehuda Aryeh Ben Moshe Zichrono Levracha, and by Ayelet Hermel in memory of her grandmother, Rivka, Regina, Bat, Fega, and Ephraim. We're going to start at the Mishnah. As we're continuing along all sorts of random topics that are joined together, the sheet today I organized a little differently, kind of topical, because we're jumping from topic to topic, and I thought instead of, I'd give you like a perspective on the page, like what are the issues dealt with on the page, so I recommend, especially after class, you can just use the sheet as a way to kind of look at the pages at a glance and see what are all the things that we covered, because it's sometimes a little confusing, we're just jumping from topic to topic. You can put a, a cooked item inside a pit in order to protect it. Okay, maybe it was a way of keeping it cool, right? It generally in, in the middle, in a pit, bottom of a pit, it will generally stay cooler. The Gemara is going to obviously ask, what would, what would you even think would be a problem, right? Why does the mission, need, you wouldn't tell us, oh, you can walk down the block on Shabbat because that's obviously allowed. So why is it telling us this? You can take, and here it seems like you're putting water that's good water inside a vessel, and you put it inside the bad water in order to cool them down. Let's say the water's warm and you want to keep it cold. Again, this is without refrigeration. This is how they would do things. So you could put it into cooler water in order to cool it off. It's not a problem. Again, what would you think would be the issue? Okay, and here they're trying them raim raim, okay, in bad water. But here, obviously, you're not throwing the water into the bad water. You're keeping the water in a jug, putting it into the bad water in order to cool it off. Um, you can put cold water in the sunlight in order to warm it up. I don't know if you ever tried this on Shabbat, right? If you ever want to, you know, you take a challah from the freezer and it's not defrosted, right? And the best way to heat it up is just put it in the sun. So you're allowed to do that. If your clothes got wet, let's say you got stuck in a thunderstorm and your clothes are soaking wet, you can walk in them and you don't have to worry that you might come to squeeze them out and it's a problem. But but if, oh, Rashi also says, right, if your clothes, let's say, got dropped into water, let's say they fell into water. So you could, what you do is you wear them you can't, what can't you do? You can't hang them out to dry. Why can't you hang them out to dry? Because it will look like you laundered them on Shabbat. Okay, this is always an issue. If you want to hang your clothes out to dry on Shabbat, let's say you got soaked by the rain. So you can't put them on your line on Shabbat because your clothesline, because it looks like you can hang it in your house, you know, in some spot, or maybe even outside, but you have to hang it in a way that doesn't look like you launder them on Shabbat and therefore not on your clothesline where you generally put your laundry out. But when you get, let's say you're outside the city and you're walking home, I think they assume maybe you drop them in the river on the way home. When you get home, or let's say you were walking in a big puddle and the bottom got soaked. So when you get into the city, go to the outermost courtyard, you know, the first one you get to when you get into the city. There you can already hang them out to dry in the sun, but not in front of other people. You have to do it in a hidden kind of way so nobody sees. Again, the issue becomes marit ayin. We're worried people are going to see and think that you laundered your clothes on Shabbat. So now we're going to go one by one through these cases. First, the Gemara is going to ask on the first few, Pshita, isn't this obvious that it's allowed and why on earth is the Mishnah telling us this? You might have thought you can't put a, a cooked item inside the pit to cool off because what might happen if you're going to put a pot inside you're going to want a flat surface because otherwise it might tilt and fall, fall over. If you need a flat surface, what might you do to the dirt at the bottom? You might flatten it out. And therefore, we're not worried that that's going to happen. We allow you to do it. We're not worried about that, but you might have thought that we'd be worried about you flattening it out. Remember, that's the whole problem of digging a hole. You know, it comes from digging a hole and, and flattening out the ground. Remember, flattening out the ground is either if it's outdoors, it's because of cholesh, and if it's indoors, it's because of bone, of building. Right, that's the whole reason why you're not allowed to sweep on Shabbat. Right, and sweeping is their kind of sweeping, not our kind of sweeping. Their kind of sweeping was sweeping in dirt. But if you want to sweep a dirt area on Shabbat, it's problematic. If you have 
good water, you're allowed to put it in a jug inside the bad water. So again, pshita, isn't that obvious? So they say, well, the reason why they say it's safer eats trichale. They wanted to use that as a lead into the next case to say that at Hatsone in Bahama, you can put cold water into the sun. So they say, but Hanami Pshita, isn't it obvious? You can put cold water in the sun and warm it up by the sun. So they say, You might have thought that it's forbidden to put your something out to heat up in the sun, because if we allow you to heat it up in the sun, you might come to accidentally think that you can heat it up in by with a with a coal. And therefore, we don't want you to do that. Um I just want to, someone, um, someone wrote about that. You might think people, people might think that I launder them. I thought that that's what I said about that. The whole concern is that people will think that you laundered the clothing. That's the problem. Maybe I didn't say that, but that was the intent. Okay. We're talking before about the case where you were, um, you hung out your clothes to dry. There's a concern. People will think you laundered them. Okay. Moving on. Um, so if your clothes got wet. Anytime the rabbi said, because of Marit Ayin, that we're worried, people might think, like people will think that I launder my clothing, it's even going to be forbidden in the Chedre Chadarim. Okay? In, what does that mean? In a secret place where no one else can see you. Okay? It's going to be forbidden. So now they say, so now they're going to say, well, then our Mishnah seems to contradict that. Tanan says in the Mishnah, You can hang them out to dry, just not in a place where people will see. So they say, uh, Actually, this whole issue, and this is, a, this is a very important issue that goes across all sorts of cases. I'll give you a good example. Um, what's a good example? Um, Maybe that's not the best example. Maybe it's not Marie Ayin. But they talk about like second day of Yom Tov. If you're in Chutz Laaretz and you generally keep one day, and when you're in Chutz Laaretz, you're supposed to keep two days, and there's all different opinions. Do you keep two days? Do you do what you do normally, which is keep one day? And then they say, well, you can do things But some people say you can't do things because anything that's a sur outside would also be a sur. Now, why is that, by the way? There's a few different reasons. Um, so, First of all, one option is maybe someone will see you, right? Maybe no place is actually totally secret and maybe someone can actually see you. Another possibility is if we allow you to do it, you might accidentally come to do it somewhere else. And that's potentially a problem. Um, okay, so now they say that whole issue about whether you could do this, whether you could hang them out to dry in this courtyard where nobody's really looking, is that allowed or not, is a debate. Because some people hold you can't because even bechadrei chadarim is asur. So tonight, detanya shodcham bechama v'lo kenegad am. Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon osrim. Okay, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon say you can't do it. Tanakama says you can do it. Amar Rab hamina er. Okay, so and this, by the way, now I see the person who commented before. The the comment was on about the fact that you can wear them without concern, right? If your clothes got wet and you're walking, then you are allowed to wear them and people aren't concerned that you launder them. I assume there are people aren't concerned that you launder them because you're wearing them wet. People don't generally, as when you launder clothing, you don't generally wear them soaking wet. So I think that would be the reason why we're not really concerned about that. Okay. Shabbat Chayav Chatat. If you, now we're going to have an interesting machlok at Rashi Tosfot. This is what Hannah Dreyfus um, chose to discuss this week in Gethet, which is up today on the site, about shaking off your clothes on Shabbat. So if you shake off your clothes on Shabbat, presumably from dirt or from something, Rashi says, taking off dust. Just to shake dust off your clothing is considered laundering. Rashi says, zehu libuna. This is the way you clean your clothing, by taking off dust. So if you have dust or dirt on your clothes and you take it off, it sounds like Rashi is saying, even without water, that's laundering. Okay, that sounds quite machmir. Tosfot says, and he quotes Rabbeinu Hanana, he says, no, we're talking about to shake your cloak off if there's dew on your cloak, meaning it's wet. Only if it's wet, because Tosfot says it can't possibly be, we would have libun, washing, laundering without water. So he disagrees with Rashi on this, and that's what the whole parak of Gephet is about. If you want to learn it more in depth, you can listen to that. Um, or you can also read it. It's both in audio or in, it's also written up. So I'm going to air you can find it on the Hebrew side of the website. I'm going to air Okay, it's forbidden. This is laundering. 
but now we're going to have all sorts of limitations on this. Only bechadite, only on new clothing. But it's not the general way to launder old clothing, only if it's brand new. Not white or red clothing, only black clothing. Because you now, you go with Rashi, taking dust off of black clothing would be a way of cleaning it. But he says on red or white, it's not so noticeable. It's interesting. You always think white. Everything shows on white clothing. But I was, when my kids were little, I never understood why anybody bought me white clothing for my kids, right? Why would you ever wear it? They wear it once and it's stained and that's the end of it. But anyway, according to them, it's specifically, maybe Rashi makes sense also, the dust is going to be more of a problem on black. Not exactly sure, but that's how they, that's how things were then, the black, but not red and white. Late Lamba, vihu de kapiralayu. And also it has to be something that you generally don't want to be on your clothing. So now we're going to say, um, okay, we have three criteria here. One is it has to be new. Two is it has to be black or dark. And three is it has to be something that you're bothered by. Okay, now this obviously becomes very subjective. And that's going to lead us into the next section. Ula ukulele popedita. He got to popedita. Chazu rabbanan de kaminat seglimai. We saw they were shaking off their clothes. Amar kamachalalim rabbanan shabta. He comes in and he says, all these people are Mahalal Shabbat. What's going on here? Amar lehu, Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda said to them, now interesting, he doesn't respond to Ula. He says to the rabbis, Nifutse le ba'ape, clean off your clothing in front of him, okay? Show him. Anam lo kapdina midi. We are not careful about this. We don't care. And therefore you're allowed to do it, right? It's counterintuitive. You could do it even though we don't really care, right? This, this isn't the way we generally launder our clothing. Abai have a kai kamei Rav Yosef. Another story. Abai was in front of Rav Yosef. Amarle, Havle. By the way, Ula. It's just interesting because he was from. He came. He was went back and forth Eretz Israel to Bavel. So he was kind of like an outsider here when he came in. So Abai was in front of Rav Yosef. Amarle, Havli kumtai. He says, "Pass me." Rav Yosef says to him, "Pass me my hat." Chazid ika talale. Abai saw that there was dew on it. Now, by the way, this is one of Tosfos' proofs. You see, they were talking about dew, and the concern is shaking off the dew. Okay, he said, um, He didn't want to pass it to him because he was worried that as he passed it, he would shake off the water, and that would be a problem because it looks like laundering. So, or it is laundering, right? It would be cleaning it off. So, Rab Yosef's son hesitating, and he said, Throw it to me. We're not concerned with this. This is not something that bothers us, the dew on the hat. And therefore, it's allowed. I'm Rabbi Yitzchak for Yosef. I'm Rabbi Yochanan. Now we're moving on to another topic. If you carry your talit folded up on your shoulder, that's a way we carry things. You'll be high for carrying. Okay, it's a problem of the malacha of carrying. Because again, if you remember, and this is what we're going to discuss, there's a fine line between carrying and between um, and between wearing as clothing. So if you carry it folded up on your shoulder, that's carrying, that's not the way we generally wear it. And then your chayav chatat, it's forbidden by Torah law. Tanya Namihachi, there's a brighter to support this. So suit, okay, this is like the book Caps for Sale. You remember that book, right, where he piles all the caps on his head? So here we have so suit, people who sell clothing, hayotzim betalitot mekupalot umunachot al ktefehen, if you Put them all piled up on your shoulder, right? It's like the capsule around his head. Bishabat chayavim chata. Okay, you're, this is by Torah law. It's forbidden because this is the way we carry. And by the way, even if you're not someone who's selling your wares, let's say kach. The Mishnah gave an example of generally people who generally go out that way, but it really means anybody who goes out that way would be obligated. It's a storekeeper who goes out with his money in a, in a, um, wrapped up in a, in a, a, a sheet, something like that. Okay. Chayav, chatat. This also is permitted, is prohibited by Torah law. And they didn't just mean a chenvani, they really meant anybody. This was generally the way he carried it. Okay, and it's, he wouldn't, right, maybe there's a way you, you could wear it if it was in a pouch or something, but this was carried in a, in, a, in a cloth or something like that, and that makes it more of a problem. Now, you have to wonder, 
what are you talking about? Isn't it forbidden to carry money in general? Is it money muktzah? Whole issue, right? Question, why that's not mentioned here. Could be, by the way, it just popped into my head. Maybe the issue is money is muktzah, but that's all durabanan. This we're saying is a surmi do to carry it in this way. And the issue is carrying, not muktzah. Now, these bright toad all talked about people that are carrying things in ways that are considered carrying and not wearing, and therefore it's forbidden. Now we're going to talk about the opposite. People who wear things and therefore it's permitted. Haratanim. Okay, it's not clear what ratanim are. Some people say it's runners. Some people say it's people from the city of Reten or Ratan or something like that. Haratanim yotzim besudarin sha'aktefehen. They can go out with their scarves on their shoulders. Velo ratanim bilvanabru ela koladam. And not just them, but really anybody can go out with their scarves on their shoulders. Ela shedarkan shal ratanim latzei pekaf. What they seem to mean here are these long scarves. It's kind of the way I think of it is almost like a, right, a shawl wrapped around. It's not a problem because that's the way people wear them and not for, people don't do that for carrying purposes. Amar Rabbi Yehuda. Maseh b'horkanus b'nosh Rabbi Lezer ben Horkanus. Okay, Horkanus, the son of Rabbi Lezer ben Horkanus. Sheyat sabes sudar shal ketefo b'shabat. He went out with this scarf on his shoulders. Ela shenimakru chalo b'etzbo. But he had a string attached to it that was tied around his finger. What's the purpose of the string? To make sure that if it were to fall off, it wouldn't, right, he wouldn't end up carrying it, it would stay on basically, to keep it on in place. So you don't have the concern that maybe you'll carry it for Amod if it falls off of you. So right, we know a scarf theoretically could fall off. So, This is permitted even without the string. You don't need the string tied around it or the cord or whatever you want to call it. And he says, in fact, this is the halacha, you don't have to have it tied. Another story with Ula. He comes to the house of Asi Barheni. They asked him, Can you make a spout with your clothing on Shabbat? No, don't really know what a spout on your clothes are. We're going to have to see in a minute. Amar lehu, hachi amar rabi ilai, asur lasot marzev b'shabbat. Says, no, it's forbidden. My Marzev, what is this? I'm Rav Chista, Kisei Bavliata. It's the, the pouch of the Bavliim. Okay, that didn't really help us either, but Rashi, Rabbi Nochal, have a bit of a different, different explanations about what exactly this is, but it seems to be somehow, if you think about the way people wear their talitot and they put them over their shoulders, somehow they did it, but they draped, like according to Rabbi Nochal, they draped the left side over the right and the right over the left, and it creates a sort of pouch, like a pocket, there and that is forbidden okay because that's kind of creating this it's not exactly a spout it's more like a pocket and that's forbidden to do on shabbat okay it's forbidden to make this kind of thing um so he says what if i wear it like this we don't know exactly what he's doing but he goes and he asks can i wear it like this and he says so what if i wear it like this and then Amara Papa, Nakud Hai Klala Biadeh. This is the rule. Okay, this is how you know. Kol Adata de Lichnufe Asul. Kol de Lina'o Shave. If you're wearing it to gather the, the extra parts, right? Remember, these are long. You don't want them dragging on the floor. So if you're gathering it for that purpose, it's forbidden. If you're doing it to look nice, you want it to look, it's a pretty look, then you're allowed. Okay, so that's your that's your test, how you know if it's allowed or not. Like this case of, again, they're referring to all these cases that we don't exactly know what happened, but they're saying just like he did it, okay? This is how they spoke in those days, right? They'd say, oh, look at him. We do the same now, right? Look at the way so-and-so wears it. Now you know how you can do it. Obviously, this doesn't help us many generations later. Okay, there was a case with Rebbe. He goes out to the fields. This is Rabbi Yudan Nasi. Okay, he had the two sides of his talit on his shoulders. We're going to have three versions of the story. Version number one, okay, it's always going to be Rebbe. The question is, who bumps into him? So according to the first version, it's the son of the father-in-law of Rabbi Meir, meaning Rabbi Meir's brother-in-law. And he says to him, did not Rabbi Meir obligate one in a chatat for doing what you're doing. In other words, this is a stormy doraita. Some people read that line a little differently, right? It's always tricky when you say a rhetorical question, right? So according to this, right? That's one way to read it. If you read it 
not as a question, but as a statement. In this case, Rabbi Meir wasn't Machayev a Chatat, but he was Machayev de Rabbanan, meaning, right, it's not forbidden by Torah law, but it is forbidden by the rabbis. Either which way he's telling him it's forbidden. It's just a matter, as he's saying, it's forbidden by Torah law or it's forbidden by rabbinic law. Amarle, so Rebbe's reaction is, lo dictate Rabbi Meir Akan. I didn't think Rabbi Meir meant what I'm doing. Okay, I didn't think he was, he was particular to what I was doing. But in any case, Shoshel Rebbe Talitov. And in any case, he takes off his cloak and he says, okay, if you say it's Aser, I'm going to agree with you. Know, I'm going to be respectful to you and I'm going to take it off. So that's version number one. Version number two. It was Rabbi Akiva's son-in-law, not Rabbi Meir's brother-in-law. Okay, it was some in-law, it was some big rabbi, it's just not clear who it was, some relation to him. Amar, Rabbi Akiva chatat, and then the son-in-law of Rabbi Akiva says, didn't Rabbi Akiva forbid this? Amar lo, dictate Rabbi Akiva Khan, and then he says, what, Rabbi Akiva really thought so? But in any case, shall shell Rabbi Talito, and again, Rabbi takes off his talit. The third version is a little bit different than the other two. Kiata Rav Shmuel Bar Rav Yehuda Amar Nish Al Itma. It wasn't a case where Rebbe was doing this and he was told, "Isn't that forbidden what you're doing?" It was that Rebbe was asked the question and Rebbe answered that it's okay, and then came in whoever it was. This version doesn't say who it was and started questioning him and said, "But doesn't so and so, whether Rebbe Meir or Rebbe Akiva, forbid this?" And then Rebbe changed his mind and decided to forbid it. Okay, so debate what the versions are, debate whether it's Chayav Chatad or Asur Midar Abanan, right? It's not clear. It's in, this goes back to what we saw last time. Would it be, could it be that somebody thinks it's for, permitted entirely and someone else thinks it's forbidden me to oraita, right? And then you could theoretically, in this kind of case, you could say yes. Because what's the issue here? The issue here, it's all subjective. We're dealing with subjective items here. This is would you normally wear it this way or would you not wear it this way? And that could change something from permitted entirely to forbidden from Torah law, right? And maybe the issue between Rebbe and whoever was arguing with him was, is this a typical way that people wear it or is it not a typical way that people wear it? And then that obviously sticks in a different category. So theoretically, it actually does make sense that one person might actually think one extreme and the other would think the other extreme because it's all a matter of what's typically done and what's not typically done. Mishnah. Again, we're moving on to all different topics. These are all things that maybe, right? The past mission were things that, is there a concern that you might come to do a malacha or your people might think you could do a malacha or, right, there's, or maybe there's no concern. Here also, we're talking about issues where there might be a concern for something. If you wash yourself on Shabbat, you bathe in uh, water in a cave or water in Tiberia. There's a big debate what this water in a cave is. Is water in a cave water that you heated up before Shabbat and put it in a cave to keep it warm? And then the question is, is it water heated up from Shabbat? If you remember, you're not allowed to bathe in water heated up from before Shabbat, but theoretically, even though generally we don't do this anymore, but one could bathe, according to the Mishnah, in Tiberia, water that was naturally hot, right? The hot springs. Or is Mema Ara water that's naturally warm because it's in a cave and because of that it keeps it warm. So you bathed in these waters. Soon the Gemara is going to say that this is talking about someone who shouldn't have but did it anyway. Okay, And then it makes a lot more sense if you talk about that the water wasn't naturally heated but it was actually heated before Shabbat. And we know that that's forbidden to do. And this is talking about, well, if you did it anyway, and then we want to know what happened at the next stage. Okay, And at the next stage, what happened? Nistapeg, you dried off. Obviously the Metavaria you're allowed to in any case, okay? But the Mema Ara, it sounds like you're not really allowed to. That's what the Gemara is going to say. The, but they're going to they're going to uh, derive it from the wording. Ha Rochetz means one who did it, which sounds like if it was allowed, it would say you can be Rochetz, and then what about drying off, okay? And what happens after you dry off, which is their issue. Um, Tosa is going to say it's not every single time it says one who did this means Bidiyevit. It's really not allowed. But, uh, sorry, l'chatchila, it's not allowed. This is only if you did it, but that's a whole aside. So, so you went and you, went, you bathed. Then you dried off. Even if you dried off with 10 different towels, which means that each towel is not very wet. Imagine if you dried off from bathing 10 different towels, you're certainly not, your towel is not going to be very wet. You cannot bring them home. 
Now here we're talking about a situation where there's no problem with carrying, that's not our issue. Okay, let's say there's an A roof or you're within you know, your courtyard, whatever it is. But the point is here that we're concerned with maybe you'll come to squeeze out the towel. You might squeeze out what's in the towel to dry it off and that will be the problem. But 10 different people can use the same towel, dry off with it, right, their face, their hands, their legs, their feet, and then they could carry it home, even though that's obviously going to be much more waterlogged than these other 10 towels. Okay, right now I'm going to leave you in suspense. Why exactly is there this difference? It sounds counterintuitive, but we'll get to it in the Gemara. Mibi'im, um, so, sorry, sachin ume machine. Moving on to another topic. You can put oil on your body and rub it in, okay, for pleasurable purposes. Avalomit amlin, okay, but you can't. Now, in Hebrew, this word generally means you can't do sport. But what they seem to mean here is you can't rub it in thoroughly, like a very serious massage that would heat up your body to, this, to the point where sweat would come out of your body. Or potentially it means doing sport where a lot of sweat comes out of your body. However, the purpose here seems to be different. Okay, there was a recent tshuva written by Rav Stav and, um, and his son Rav Avram Stav about how because of Corona, that people can exercise on Shabbat, even though you're sweating. Um, I didn't read it inside, but I assume they make reference to this because here it seems to be that the reason why you're sweating is because of the sweat. The sweat was seen as something healthy, like going to a sauna and sweating. Having the sweat come out of your body is your purpose. That's going to be forbidden. And they say it's because of uvde de chol. It's something we generally do on a weekday. Um, one could obviously apply that to sport and, you know, that sport also is some weekday activity. Uh, anyway, whether this, it doesn't seem to mean here actual sport, because again, sport, the purpose is you're doing it for health purposes for your body, but not for the sweat to come out. It's not because you want to sweat specifically, although maybe one could argue and say maybe that is why some people do it. I don't know. Um, the lo garin. Okay, and you also can't, they had a particular scraper that they would scrape the, the oil off their bodies or something like that. So you can't do that because it's also more intense. It's, I think these are all more labor intense and they all seem to be in the category of uvde de chol, something generally people do on a weekday. We'll see in the Gemara that they make an exception if you do it a little bit differently than you do on a weekday and that already resolves the issue of uvde de chol. Ain your dim le cordima. You can't go into the swampy waters or muddy waters on Shabbat. I don't know why you want to, but you can't. Ve'ain osin apiktosin. You can't make this concoction that people would drink. It was some drink that people would make in order to induce vomiting. Ve'ain matzvinet hakatan. We saw this before. It seems to be the babies, when they were born, they would kind of put their limbs into place. You can't do that. Um, it's like building. We'll see that in the Gemara later. You can't put back a break. If a bone breaks, you can't set it. One thing they would do, they would pour cold water over it. You can't do that. You can wash in cold water, and if, and it's like in a normal manner, and if it ends up fixing it, great. I don't know if people actually try this nowadays, but it was obviously something they did then to set your bone. Katane. It says in the Mishnah, So now we start off with this Mema'ara. It puts it right next to Meitveria. Often when things are a lot, you know, put right opposite each other in the Mishnah or parallel to each other, we say it must be one is similar to the other. It must be we're talking about hot water. Um, so now they're going to say, because it's hot water, and because it says harochets, as I mentioned before, it sounds like you can do, if it's already done, that's what the Mishnah is referring to, but you can't do it lechatchila. You can't do this, right? It's really forbidden to do. It's just, if you did it, and then you dry off, this is the halacha. So now they say, michla, from here one can infer what, though? That lechatz behem, because it says harochets, is going to be forbidden. But lihishtatef, but if you pour the water on top of you, remember we had this whole distinction. We learned about this in the beginning of the Masechet on Lamited. Okay, often at the end of the Masechet, it starts reviewing things that were learned previously. It's not necessarily that they're trying to review, it's just that everything overlaps. And right, when we learned it then, we haven't learned it here. But now that we're learning it here, we can remember that we learned it earlier. Afilu lechatchila shapir dami. Sounds like according to our mission, because it only said arochets and it didn't say hanishtatef someone who poured water on top of them, it seems to infer that 
Lirchotz is asul lechatchila, is forbidden lechatchila to start out doing it. But lishtatev, to pour water on yourself, would be allowed, would be entirely permitted. Mane, who does this go according to? Because not everybody thinks you could take hot water and pour it on top of you, right? This would almost be like a shower, right? A shower versus a bath. You can pour water on top of you. So who would say that? Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon says that pouring water on top of yourself, even with hot water, is allowed. Ditanya. Lo yishtatef adam bein b'chamim bein b'tsonein. According to Divrei Rabbi Meir, according to Rabbi Meir, you cannot pour water on yourself, not cold, not hot. Rabbi Shimon matil. Rabbi Shimon allows both hot and cold. Rabbi Yehuda omer b'chamim asur b'tsonein mutal. He distinguishes between hot and cold. Okay, so there you see our mission must follow Rabbi Shimon, who says that, you can pour water, you just can't bathe in it. Again, these are all inferences from the Mishnah. It's not so clear that the shot reading of the Mishnah really is everything they're saying, just to put that out there. But that's the way the Gemara is understanding the Mishnah. So Resha, Ributa Kamashmalan, Vesefa, Ributa Kamashmalan. Each one is talking about an extreme case. Why is each one talking about an extreme case? Remember, one person can drive with 10 towels and still can't carry them home. And 10 people can drive with one towel and yes, carry them home. So the Mishnah is trying to teach you the widest case in each case. How so? Reisha ributa kamashmalan. The Reisha wants to teach you even though there's really not a lot of water in them. Since the person is alone, he might come to forget the halacha and wring it out and he has no one to remind him. Sefer ributa kamashmalan is going to teach the exact opposite. Since there are a lot of people, one will remind the other. If you remember, we learned this in the beginning of the Masechet in Bamem Adlikin about the candle. I think it was when there's a concern that you might tilt the candle, right, in certain situations. And we said, if there's more people in the room, then we're not worried because if you go to tilt it, the other, oh, it was, now I remember, it was two people reading together. Two people can read by the light and you don't have to worry that they might tilt the candle, right, and which is forbidden. And that's because one will remind the other if the other one goes to, to tilt it. So there you had the exact same issue. Um, According to this Tanakama here in the Braita, you can dry yourself with a towel, but you have to leave it in the, in the windowsill. You can't give it to the people working in the bathhouse. Why is that? because they're chashudim aloto daval. This is what they do for a living. They need to dry the towels and have them ready for the next person. Right? It seems like they didn't necessarily launder them in between. Um, particularly nowadays, that would sound pretty you know, hor horrifying. But anyway, they wanted to dry them, so they would squeeze them and then dry them out. And because of that, you can't give them your wet towels. You can dry off even with one towel and bring it to your house. He seems to disagree and think that this is okay. Amar lu Abay le Rabbi Yosef. Hilchatamai. So Abay says to Rabbi Yosef, so what's the halacha? Amar le, ha Rabbi Shimon, ha Rabbi, ha Shmuel, ha Rabbi Yochanan. The four of these people all say it's okay. And if the four of these people say it's okay, well, I would say like this, right? If it's okay for them, it's okay for me, right? This is a pretty good lineup. So let's see where they each say this. Rabbi Shimon, ha Damaram. We just quoted it from the bright. Rebbe, de Tanya, ma Rebbe, Shayinu le Medim Torah, it's a Rebbe Shimon Bitkoa, Hayinu ma Alim, Shemen Valonti, Mechatser la Gago, Migago la Kapaf, and Shayinu Migim, it's a Mayan. Here again, you see they were bathing on Shabbat. So what did they do? They wanted to go to the Mayan to rinse off. And what would they, right? Shayinu Rochatzimbo, that we would wash ourselves there. So what did we do? We were learning Torah with Rabbi Shimon in Tkoa. We would take, now it would seem, this, if you remember, we learned this whole halacha by Rabbi Shimon. And according to Rabbi Shimon, you can move things from all these places that are not meant for living, as living purpose, living places, like the roof and the, and the courtyard and the karpaf, right, which is a big area. It's not a Rashida Rabin, right? It's not exactly, right? It's this, not a place that's kind of with, a, with walls around, but not for the purposes of living, not like a house. So you could take, they would take, okay, not only can you do this, but this is what they would do, the Tamidei Chachamim. So what were they doing? They would take the oil and the, right, they wanted oil for bathing and their, and their towels, and they would take them from their courtyard, okay? It would have to be, it wasn't in their houses. Remember, he says, if it's in your house before Shabbat, you can't take it out into the courtyard. 
but you can take it from the courtyard to the roof and from the roof to the Karpat. You basically take it through all these permitted places till we got to the Mayan, Shayinu Rochatzimbo, where we wanted to bathe. And there you see that they, now, what don't you see here? That they took their towels home. But the assumption is that if they brought their towels there, they certainly weren't going to leave them at the Mayan. But it wasn't like they had these junky towels they could just throw away. Right? In those days, you throw anything away. If you leave it there, someone might steal it. So it must be they also took them home. And this one is not 100% clear. Shmuel, um, uh, okay, so Shmuel, where does that appear? Okay, he says it explicitly. You can do this and bring it into your house. Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, Rabbi Yochanan, also he says it explicitly, So now they ask, Did Rabbi Yochanan really say this? Okay, so we now show the four people who allow it. Now we're going to say, Rabbi Yochanan really say this? Rabbi Yochanan halacha kistam mishnah. We know that Rabbi Yochanan holds like the stam mishnah. And what does our mishnah say? Our mishnah disagrees with this halacha. Um, it says, Utsnam minista pega filu be'eser alon tiyot. Says right, even with ten, right? Lo yivim biado, you can't bring them back into your house. So what do we answer? Hau ke ben chachinai matnei. This must be taught in the name of ben chachinai. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan's version of the Mishnah ended with divrei Rabbi Yochanan, uh, Rabbi uh, divrei ben chachinai. Okay, it was the, this is the words of ben chachinai, which means it's not a stam Mishnah. Stam Mishnah means a Mishnah that's not attributed to any particular person, and that's how Rabbi Yochanan would explain that this is. No, that the, why we don't hold like the Mishnah. By the way, if we say the Mishnah is ag against Rabbi Shimon, which we seem to be saying, it's a little bit of a problem because we talked about the Rochetz part is Rabbi Shimon, who says ha Rochetz and not ha Mishtatek, right? So it's a little bit tricky here on why the Gemara doesn't ask that, I don't know, but I'm leaving it open as a question. Okay, going on. Amar Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Another thing that Rabbi Yochanan said, ha'ol yarin mevi'im balare nashim lebe bane. Okay, they would bring these towels for women. They were special towels for women. I, they were, it seems like they were longer. Maybe the women wanted to cover more of their bodies. Um, anyway, they brought these towels for the women. How did they carry them to the bathhouse? They would cover them over their heads, right? They would carry it over their heads, kind of like a, they would wear the towels as opposed to carrying them folded up. Mane um, libne chele. Oh, in a second, sorry, I skipped. Amalahu Rava, Libene Machosa. Rava said to the people of Machosa, oh no, I skipped a bunch. Sorry. Sakinta. Okay, what about Sakinta? This is a type of, um, this is like if you wear it like a talit over your shoulders. Sarich Lichshor Shnera Sheha Lamata. You have to tie the two heads together down below. So Amar Bichia Barava, Amar Yochanan, what's, what's Lamata? Lamata Miktefayim. Below your shoulders. Okay, imagine the way a talit goes. So the parts that are hanging right below your shoulders, they would tie those parts together. This seems to be some sort of very light scarf type thing. And the concern is again that it will blow off, right? Remember the other time you didn't need it, but in this case, you need something to tie it together. Otherwise, it might blow off of you. When you give clothes to the chayalim, to the soldiers that are coming through, what is this? So here we're going to see they allowed things because the non-Jewish soldiers that came into town, they would make the Jews give them things. This comes up all over in the Gemara. It comes up that you have to give them food. You have to give them other things. If you remember, you can give them, there's something, some halacha about demai with them and other things. Um, you can give them clothing. How do you do it? Sharvivu luhu lamata miknefayim. Okay, you tie your clothes under the, your shoulders and then you can kind of go out wearing them. Now we're up to the part about the oil. You can rub the oil on your, on your, where your intestines are, but you have to do it some different way than you do it on a regular day. Again, so it doesn't appear like an uvda de chol, like something generally done on a weekday. Uh, so how, how is it different? And here, interestingly, we have two different opinions. Again, this day, today is all about subjective and what was generally done in one place was not necessarily generally done in another place or by individuals. So Rabbi Chama Amar, Sachba Harkach Memashmesh. First you pour the oil on and then you rub it in, that's already different than normal. And Rabbi Yochanan Amar, the exact opposite. Sachu Memashmesh Bevatachat. If as you're pouring, you're rubbing it, that's the opposite of what we normally do. Avalomitalmi, now we get to this part about sweating. 
אמר רבי חייא בר אבא, אמר רבי יוחנן, אסור לעמוד בקרקעי איתה של דיומסה, מפני שמעמלת. אוקיי, okay, here we're going to learn that you can't stand in the bottom of the דיומסה river because it heats up your body and causes you to sweat. So here's where you see that it's the sweating that's the issue. ומרפא, and it heals. אמר רבי יוחנן, אמר רב, כל ימיה של דיומסה עשרים ואחד יום. בעצרת מן המניין. The days of the year that you can go to this river דיומסה, and it will be therapeutic for you. Okay, this is just kind of... interesting information, is the 20, 21 days a year, and Shavuot is part of those 21 days. So now they ask, what they mean is basically, Atzeret is either the beginning or Atzeret is the end of those days. So they don't know which one, right? Atzeret's a name for Shavuot, because it's the end of Pesach, right? It's kind of like, we, the Pesach leads into Shavuot, just like Shmini Atzeret is the end of Shavuot. Right? It's its own separate holiday, but the end of it. So now, Ibailu. So they ask, Is it the first part of the 21 days or is it the last day of the 21 days? Let's learn it from what Shmuel says. Remember, Shmuel was always the, he had um, a lot of advice about medicine. All the drinks that people drink for medicinal purposes, they're very effective between Pesach and Atzeret. There's a certain time of year where if you drink these drinks, they'll be effective. So what do you see? Must be the Pesach from Atzeret is the time period, just like for the drinks, also for going in this river. But the Gemara rejects this and says, no, those are two different things. There, the more the world is cold, okay, as long as it's cold out, the drinks are more effective for you. But here it must be, it's more therapeutic because it's hotter, because it causes you to sweat. So you would think then it would specifically start from Shavuot and go 21 days. You obviously have to explain why not in the middle of the summer then, but okay, we'll leave that question aside. I'm Rabbi Chalbo. Chama de Pugiata Umay de Diom said, once we're already talking about this Mayim of the Diom said, now we're going to say that this wine from the place of Pugiata and the, and the, the water of the Diom said, the 10 tribes of Israel got left behind because they spent their time dealing with pleasurable things like drinking this fancy wine and, um, and doing this sweating in the river, the river Diomse. And now we're going to hear a story about Rabbi Lezer ben Arach. We don't get the whole story here, but if I have time, I'll try to tell you the whole story. Rabbi Lezer ben Arach, Ikla, Rabbi Lezer ben Arach, sorry, Ikla Lahatam. He got to there, he came to the, the river of the Yomset, and he got pulled in by the, by the temptation of spending your time in this water, and he forgot all of his learning. When he came out of there, he went to read from a Sefer Torah. And instead of saying the words, he came out, their hearts were deaf which basically means it's a reference to himself, right? That he basically became deaf from learning. He didn't have any Torah anymore. Ba'a Rabbana Racha Me'aleh, they, they prayed for him because if you remember, Rabbi Lezer ben Arach was the prized student of Rabbi, Lezer, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai. I think it appears in Mesechet Avot. So anyway, they prayed for him, v'hadar Talmudeh, and his learning came back. V'hainu d'etnan, and this is where we see Rabbi Nehorai Omer, hevei gole l'makom Torah v'al tomar shitavo acharecha. You should leave your home place and go exile yourself to a place where there's Torah. And don't say, the Torah is going to come after me, because your friends will help you support your Torah when they're far away from you. Don't rely on your own wisdom because you'll lose it all. They say it wasn't really Rabbi Nehorai, it was Rabbi Nehemi who said this, but some people say Rabbi Lezar ben Arach Shmo. It was he himself who said this after he lost all his Torah. Because he lit up everybody's life with Torah. Now, what's the whole story about him? Famous story, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai dies, and everybody moves, right? They all go to Yavne. Remember, that's the whole thing, right? He said, and they all move to Yavne after the destruction. And Rabbi Lezer ben Arach stays put. And in fact, it's his wife who convinces him, this is a beautiful place where we live, we don't want to leave. And she convinces him to stay, and they stay, basically. And then, as a result, he loses all his Torah because he ends up in a place where there's no rabbis anymore and there's no learning going on. And that's where this whole story comes out of. And, um, and what's interesting about him is the, there's, he's not mentioned in the Mishnah, which is fascinating because he was one of the prize students for Yochanan ben Zakkai, and yet he ends up not being mentioned in the Mishnah. So it could be because of this, because he lost all his Torah, and maybe 
I don't know exactly, but another reason is they say he died young. And also because of that, maybe his, whatever he said didn't end up in there. Anyway, it's interesting historical piece. Okay, we'll move on. Avalomit gararin, tanu rabanan, ein gorim migreret b'shabat. Okay, Sprite says the same thing, but here it adds. Rashbag, remember, this is the thing they would use to scrape off the oil off their bodies. Rashbag, this is similar to tissue above. You can't wash, but if you have dirt on your hands, then you can take it off. So if your hands are full of something really dirty, you can do it normally. It's fine. You can use it to scrape off the dirt. Rav Shmobar, Yehuda Avdalei Imei Megararata de Kaspa. He had a special silver one that his mother made him, and then he was allowed to use it on Shabbat because it was clear it wasn't, he wasn't doing it the way he did it on a regular day. And this shows how weak this whole issue of Uvde de Chol is. If you, as long as you change it a little bit, then it doesn't look like Uvde de Chol. Ain't, right? Uvde de Chol, remember, it means it's something that one would normally do on a regular weekday. Again, which is a very wide range of things one would do on a normal weekday. And your dim lakordima, you can't go in a swamp. My time on Mishum Pika, okay, because of the the the, um, the mud. Not clear what this means. All different interpretations are brought. Some people say you're going to slip and fall, and then you'll get all dirty, and then you'll want to wash yourself, and that's again a problem. Your clothes will get filthy. You'll want to wash them. Some people say it's that it's just not it's bitul onik Shabbat because if you slip and fall, is it slippery? You don't want to go in a place that's totally slippery. You'll fall, and then you'll be upset on Shabbat because you fell. You'll be upset anyway. Different options are brought because. Bunch of other options that the Mepharshim bring. Ain osim apitozim b'shabat. Amar Abba Brachana, this is the, the drink that induces vomit. Amar Abba Brachana, Amar Abba Yochana, Noshanu ele b'sam. Avabiyab, mutar, very pleasant. You can actually cause yourself to vomit by putting your hand in your mouth. That's not forbidden. It's only drinking something. Because again, that was like maybe connected with medicinal purposes, drinking, you know, drugs, things like that. You might come to crush things. Tanya Rabbi Nechemya Omer, af b'chol asur. Thankfully, he ends... This, with this, right? He says, even on a weekday, it's forbidden to make yourself to induce vomiting, because it, it's counter, it's destructive to your body. It's not a good thing. Last thing for today, you can swaddle a baby. So if you can swaddle a baby, isn't that also to kind of get, keep their limbs in place? So don't we say, so how do we allow you, allow you to swaddle a baby in a blanket? This is talking about in your spinal, by the spinal cord, where there you're really putting the bones in place and it looks like you're building, as opposed to swaddling, which is just all the limbs of the baby, and we're not really worried that that looks like bone. Okay, with that, we're going to, again, this is describing things that, right, we don't swaddle babies because we're worried their limbs are going to come out of place. Right? We swaddle them for other reasons, but we learned a lot today about the way they did things then and how different things are now than they are then. And certain things are similar, right? But certain things are quite different. Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everybody.